What's the best questions have ever been asked by a child? Well, one that immediately springs to mind is a very young child, I think he was probably year one, who asked me, do you dress yourself? Now I thought, is he asking me that because he's relating to his own experience as a very young child? Or is it because of the way I'm dressed? So that gave me some pause for thought and uh, made me a little, feel a little bit paranoid as well, to be honest. Uh, then there was a time I was visiting a reception class, so very young children, and uh, I read them a story as usual, and then I said, has anyone got any questions? And one little child put up his hand, and I said, yes, and he said, I like lions. I said, good, good. Uh, how about you? And the child, I like horses. Okay, and, um, and how about you? I like squirrels. And so it continued and uh, I beginning to realise, I was less experienced at that time, I began to realise that actually children at this age don't really fully understand what a question is. And uh, so I learnt a lot about what very young children like in the way of animals. But I did think, well, hmm, how much am I being paid for doing this? Well, maybe I ought to give the check back. Yeah, I, I talk about different things on my talks and uh, I, on one occasion I talked about the fact that I had a twin sister. And afterwards I was asked, are you identical? And I had to reply in all honesty, no, I am not identical to my sister. I suppose I could have added, it would cost me a lot of money to make myself identical to my sister and I have no plans to do so. Another question I well remember, uh, it was uh, in a library up the Rhonda Valley. It was a boy of about seven or eight. And he asked me, are you embarrassed about being a writer? I thought, ooh, that was a question I'd never anticipated. Am I embarrassed about being a writer? And uh, I didn't think I was embarrassed about it, but the more I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I am now. I was once asked, what's the smallest book you've ever written? And that's an easy one. I was able to tell them. It's this one. It's a, a version of Daily Bee published in Germany. I'm not sure why it's so tiny, because uh, the book's very popular in Germany. They actually made a stage show of Daily Bee in Germany. But for some reason, they published this book in a very, very tiny form like this. Now, I've also been asked, what is the biggest book you've ever had published? And that's an easy one. It's this one here, which, uh, it was published by Ginn back in the 90s and uh, they used to, that was when Literacy Hour started and they published these books so that the teacher could have this massive version which a teacher would read while the old children had their own little small books. So uh, that is a very, very big book and it sold a lot of copies, this one. I went all around Britain talking to schools about this story. Uh, it's actually on my website. You can actually uh, download this story now for free. But that's definitely my biggest book. And I think if, if you're ever visited by a so-called celebrity author, you could ask them what's their biggest book and see if it is as big as this one. I very much doubt it. Another question I'm often asked, and I'm sure a lot of writers are asked, is where do you get your ideas from? And, uh, you know, like as if there's a simple answer. And of course, there isn't a simple answer to it. But one thing I would say is that uh, before I became a published writer, I was a teacher in a comprehensive school. And a lot of my inspiration came from the pupils that I taught and often the witty things they said. And uh, a really good example of that actually features on right at the start of my first published novel, which was Yeats's Rap, published by Puffin back in 1986 and uh, I'd been talking to a class uh, reading a book I think it was and there was a lot of noise going on so I stopped reading put down the book 
and I said, why is it whenever I'm talking to you lot, there's a constant babbling noise going on right under my nose. This kid puts up his hand and says, it's coming from your mouth, sir. And my problem was as a teacher, you know, I found things like that funny. And in fact, I was not really suited to be a teacher at all because I was on the side of the rebels half the time. I didn't believe in school uniform. I didn't believe in most things you're supposed to believe in as a teacher. And so that was disastrous for me, really. But it did, it was, as a teacher, it was disastrous. But as a writer, it was a fantastic advantage to hear all these things, to take them all in and to use them in my first stories. I think it's what attracted publishers to me originally. There is another way in which I get ideas, and that's when you're in a situation in life where you think, oh, thank goodness this didn't happen, or that didn't happen. That would have been a disaster. Now, in a story, you make it happen. And I'll give you a good example of that is uh, we used to do home exchanges where we swap houses and go and live in someone else's houses, probably in France or somewhere else. They live in our house, we live in their house. But the, the one problem with this is, of course, you must leave the house as you find it. And we had a little girl who was a, a toddler who, you know, was fairly random and the kind of things that she might do. And uh, in fact, we, we had a swap with a house in France and um, she'd never had a nosebleed up to this time. But once we arrived in this house, she had the most profuse nosebleed you've ever seen in your life. She was covered in blood. Their blankets, their sheets, their mattresses were soaked in blood. And we had to spend, I don't know how long, cleaning this stuff off to try to leave it as it, as it was when, when she arrived. And so this gave me the idea for Thimble Holiday Havoc, the second Thimble book. You know, what would happen if we took Thimble and put Thimble into a house where we had to leave everything, you know, tidy when we left and so on. And what disasters could he bring about, you know. And uh, so that was really um, Thimble Holiday Havoc. And, you know, I, I really took it to an extreme what exactly he could do to this house. And uh, if you read it, you'll find out. Now, there was a time when I was visiting a lot of schools in South Wales and at the same time there was a clown called Mr Big who was also visiting many of the same schools and he was a very big man in a clown costume. Uh, you know, he was an entertainer. Um, and one of the questions that uh, probably most disturbed me in my visits to these schools was the question, are you Mr Big? And I thought, are they saying that because I'm funny? Or is it something to do with the fact that I have actually put on quite a lot of weight? Now, one question I'm sometimes asked is, have you met any other famous authors? Which is a funny question, really. <laughs> because uh, children don't always know how famous you are. They know, you know, if they've seen you on lots of books or whatever, they assume that everyone knows who you are. And uh, one, of the, one of the strange things about my existence is that you know, I've been doing it for 37 years and sometimes I've been selling quite a lot of books and other times I've virtually disappeared. So sometimes I'm fairly well known and sometimes I'm completely unknown. And I can visit a school and um, all the kids are so excited and they say, oh, it's him, it's him, it's him, like I'm the, the, the new messiah or something. And then other times I've been at school and no one has any idea who I am or any interest in finding out, quite frankly. So it does keep you humble doing being like that. And uh, uh, the answer to the question is, I actually don't really mix with other authors. It's not, I'm not actually a very literary person. And that, that's in some ways is quite an advantage because it means I can relate to more reluctant readers. But um, uh, no, I've met, I've met a, f a few authors, but as I say, and not, not amongst my sort of main friends or whatever, who just tend to be doing ordinary kind of jobs mainly. If you're very perceptive, you might have noticed in the last shot that a cat appeared. So that gave me an idea for an answer to the question, where do you get your ideas from? Uh, because I got the idea for The Last Free Cat, my young adult novel, from thinking 
what would it be like if you couldn't just get a cat but they were marketed by great big uh, companies who sold them for you know tens of thousands of pounds because uh, you you know because that's the only way you could get them and i thought well, what would people pay for a cat they'd probably pay a lot of money it's an incredible animal and that could happen they could decide to do that they could decide they've done it with other things they could decide to uh, you know make us pay for cats and so that was the that was the thinking behind the last free cat and then this girl gets hold of a cat that's an illegal cat because it's not been sold to her she's just found it and then she ends up on the run from the authorities and so that simple idea led to i think one of my best books and one which i would heartily recommend well anyway i've talked about a few of the questions that i've been asked as an author but i'm always happy to answer questions on almost any subject and uh, if you go to my website www.johnblake.co.uk uh, you can email questions to me our teachers can uh, get a group of questions from their classes and email them to me and i'll make a video answering them and i'm always happy to do that for schools so uh, please get in touch and uh, please read my books